Moderator, Mr. Greg Tapo. Uh, thanks for having us. This is, this is kind of a, a panel in response to the one you just uh, listened to. You know, um, I'm Greg Topo. I cover education for USA Today. Um, I've been covering uh, education for about 12 years, and one of the things that I really uh, like about this, this space is um, the fact that you guys are asking very, very different questions than the ones I hear most of the time. Um, I, from the applause lines I heard in the last panel, I, I, I just have to conclude that there are quite a few teachers in the audience. Um, you know, uh, the, the Games for Learning folks, I, I think one of the things that's exciting for me is I get up every morning and I talk to people who totally blow my mind. I'm doing really, really different things. Um, and, you know, and I, and I get to sort of have conversations about, uh, about this stuff every day. Um, I'm hoping that this panel can really um, kind of take what we heard in the last panel and really sort of punch it out and give us a sense of what's really happening. Um, there's a lot of theoretical stuff in the last uh, panel. Um, I guess I want to uh, bring out the panel. We're going to um, hear just a few minutes of sort of introduction from each of them and then we'll, we'll sort of get into the meat of it. Um, so I'm going to introduce them in the order that they're going to speak, but they can all come out, you guys, okay? So Alan first, Alan Gershenfeld from Eli Media. Okay, and Chris Curran. I can do that for him. And Jessica Millstone from the Cooney Center. Right. Steve from iCivics. And finally, Tony. You know, one of the things um, I don't have a I don't have a great story like Kevin had, you know, with his daughter in math and you know learning to, to love math. But I do have a, 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 a sort of a personal experience here. So when I was here yesterday, um, one of the one of the folks who was on the um, J, uh, Justin's panel was um, Britt Myers from Highline Games. You know, and they is Britt here. So they they created this game uh, Welder. And has anybody played Welder? It's this incredibly addictive word game. And I went up to him after, which is like, is like meeting your idol. And I went up to him afterwards and I said, are you familiar with the term lost weekend? <laughs> um, that game just killed me. Um, so what I want to do is give everybody on the panel just, just a chance to sort of tell us very quickly who they are, what they do, and Kind of the opening question that, that, that I wanted to pose to them is, like, what is the most exciting thing you're seeing? You know, what gets you out of bed? Um, and we're, we're going to take it from there. Um, this is an incredibly diverse panel, as you can see, and I think they're really, really. Um, this is the real world here. I mean, these these guys, um, if, if they don't succeed, I think this field doesn't succeed. So I'm going to start with um, Alan. And I guess I'm going to sit on the other side. Thanks, Greg. So uh, I'm Alan Gershenfeld. I'm a co-founder and president of Eline Media. Um, we're a developer and publisher for games for learning health social impact. And our core model is to partner with nonprofits, with foundations, with universities, with government agencies to turn the best research into products and services that can realize the promise of game-based learning at scale. And for me, I mean, in many ways, what gets me up in the morning are, are the type of things that, that, that Jim and Katie uh, were talking about on the panel yesterday. These are, these are big ideas. These are big thoughts. I, we believe in them strongly. And it was interesting to listen to them because in many ways, a lot of what I do every day and my colleagues at Eline are actually to turn those specific ideas into products and services. So we're working on a Game Star Mechanic, which is a middle school game design uh, curriculum and platform that both Jim and Katie were learning scientists on. We're working with Minecraft EDU. They got right into that debate, and hopefully we can dig into that debate a little bit and say, how do you take a phenomenon like Minecraft and uh, apply it in, in, in a school or at a school or informal learning context? Um, 
Historia, which a bunch of you heard about uh, yesterday or the day before. Phenomenal teacher-created game, paper board game, working wonderfully in a handful of schools. How, how do we make that available to every school? So that's, that's what we focus on. And uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion in the panel. And I guess, I guess the one thing I would say is there's unbelievable innovation from folks like the folks you just heard from, the Jims and the Katie's. Incredible research, incredible pilots, incredible insights. I've, I started my career at Activision. I helped build Activision Studios. So when Eric Huey was talking this morning about games like Call of Duty, you know, building a studio that large and a publisher that large, there was unbelievable innovation, not just on the game design side, but on the publishing side. How do you tune products for a market? How do you look at repeatable, scalable marketing and distribution? In the educational and impact sector, it's equally important on understanding the sector that these games need to be designed for to succeed. So you can have a great game like Minecraft or SimCity or Portal. That doesn't mean it'll work in the classroom in the context. It doesn't mean it can't, but it takes a lot of work, a lot of thought, and a lot of rigor. I'm Chris Curran, and I've been in uh, education markets for over 20 years, primarily as an investor and investment banker. And our firm's education growth partners and education growth advisors are Sister companies, uh, first is a investment, uh, private equity focused growth stage equity um, investor in the global education marketplace. We've put about 200 million to work in the three years since our inception. Um, and on the other side of the business, we're a management consulting uh, firm and investment bank and help companies raise capital. We help buy and sell educational assets and IP in the global education economy. And our mission is unique in that uh, everything that we do has to also have um, a, a double bottom line return element to it. We're seeking financial returns, but we're also seeking that impact, and that falls into one of three categories. Companies that we work with or invest in have to have a demonstrated ability to improve learning outcomes, and have a demonstrated ability to drive operational efficiencies in institutions of learning, whether it's schools or colleges or training centers, or they have to have an ability, demonstrated ability to um, drive 21st century skills uh, for the modern workplace, both domestically and globally. So in terms of what gets me up in the morning, um, the mission element of what we're doing, I think, uh, speaks to much of that, but also to specific areas we'll hear we talk about it today and drive some of the conversation around our, what's happening with assessment, what's happening with means that drive engagement of students at all levels and all types of learners, and also uh, retention as it relates to course completion and re-completion in the higher atmosphere of the market and um, progressing up through a learning pathway in pre-K to 12 and, and similar means in a corporate learning environment. Uh, so I'm Jessica Millstone. I'm the Education Fellow at the Joan Gans Cooney Center at Sesame Workshop. I'm um, also very happy to be on the Admin Q stage. It's for my Sesame panel all the time. Um, so I've also worked around 20 years or so in the education field, mostly with teachers helping them use technology in the classroom. And what brought me into games and learning was thinking about very much like what Katie said about um, you, the idea that project-based learning is a, is a way to sort of change up your classroom, disrupt um, the traditional classroom. We're seeing that games are doing a lot of those same things. Um, so my work at the Community Center is really around documenting how teachers are using games in the classroom. We've done some work surveying teachers, hearing about their perspectives, um, who they are, what kinds of teachers are using games, which games they use. Um, and we also have been doing a, a series of video case studies showing teachers, showing other teachers what this looks like in the classroom. So we really feel like, uh, you know, at the Cooney Center is an amazing translation source, a little bit, as Alan said, between that theory and practice. You know, we are thinking always about what the Katie's and the Jim G's are saying in the world of games and learning, and then trying to translate that into what is actually happening in the classroom. Can you give us enough mics? Sorry. No, we can have it. got to share it. Hi, I'm Gene Koo. I'm the Executive Director of iCivics, and I'm really very excited to be here at the 10th Annual Games for Change Festival. Uh, personally, I was here at the third annual uh, conference seven years ago, and in terms of my career, that got me the job at Harvard Law School that set me off in this current path. So I'm, you know, I, I owe a lot to, to this conference for uh, making that possible. And organizationally, uh, at the fifth annual Games for Change conference, uh, uh, iCivics founder and my boss, Justice Sandra O'Connor, was the 
keynote speaker, and that was essentially where iCivics was originally uh, conceived and launched. So both myself personally and my organization have a lot to, uh, owes a lot to Games for Kane, and, and so it's really exciting to see that we've reached 10, and I hope for, for 10 or 20 more years. Um, iCivics, as I said, launched uh, five years ago, um, and we provide teachers with tools to prepare the next generation of Americans for active citizenship. Um, and at this point right now, since the, in those five years, we've uh, developed 18 games uh, that have been played collectively over five million times, registered 33,000 teachers, and reached uh, well over a million children, uh, which is an incredible scale. Uh, and arguably, it makes us one of the largest game-based learning programs out there, but the point that I wanted to make this morning is that we don't really think of ourselves as a game-based curriculum any more than we think of ourselves as a paper-based curriculum. We, we offer over 140 lesson plans, but I don't think the, the key feature that we focus on is the, the, the platform on which we happen to be distributing a particular solution. What we really think about is, and gets us up and, and excited about the work that we do, is what can we do to solve problems and challenges that teachers face in classrooms in order to better teach their kids. And if the answer is games, then the answer is games. If the answer, the answer is something else, then, then we go there. And I think that's uh, been really key to, to, to our success. It's something that Jim mentioned uh, earlier in his talk. And something I really wanted to underline is that um, we really work with teachers and everyday teachers in everyday schools. Uh, we don't assume that they have above average technologies and environments. Um, and it's really important to us to do that because schools, I really strongly believe, are both a democratic and de democratizing force in, in the U.S. For us to succeed as a civic education program, we really have to reach the majority of kids in this country. And there's really only one way to do that, and that's to work with schools as we find them. So one challenge that I would throw out as a concept is, you know, a lot of what I hear in discussion around uh, games and learning, or just learning in general, is how do we you know, break the schools that we have and remake them entirely? And, and I think there's, there's some wonderful ideas there. Um, there's, a, there's another approach that, that iCivics tends to take, which is instead of breaking the schools, uh, how do we hack them? You know, we talk a lot about hacking, and there's something about hacking that is more respectful of the thing you're working with in terms of, of starting where you are, rather than chucking it out the window and starting over again. So I, it's, it's something that I want to throw out there as an idea that we might want to talk about. Great. Uh, my name is Tony, and I'm the associate editor at NetSearch, uh, which is an online uh, resource and community that keeps track of the latest news and developments uh, on education technology from a very startup, a very grassroots angle. So we cover everything from new companies and new startups and the tools that they're building uh, to how some of the teachers and students are actually using and implementing them. Uh, and it gets to a bigger implementation issue, which um, I actually don't uh, haven't heard much uh, too much about um, at, at this conference. And I guess what really gets me up uh, um, in the morning, as, as you asked, is that there's a lot of great talent and resources that are kind of scattered around uh, in little silos. And what I really like to do is to connect these resources together. So for example, I think that education is the one thing that everyone feels like they know something about because we've all been through it. And as a result, uh, you know, we see entrepreneurs uh, building tools for problems that they felt like they had when they were kids. So like, you know, I didn't like history because of X, Y, and Z. Uh, but the reality is that you know, the, the, these X, Ys, and Zs uh, may not apply to the next generation of children. And so there needs to be some kind of communication and dialogue for you to build tools that are actually relevant to today's problems. And that's just one of like, many examples of how we try to connect not just entrepreneurs and teachers, but also uh, the investment community as well, and the researchers who are also putting out really great work, but all, a lot of that actually doesn't um, get surfaced enough. So, yeah. I'm actually going to, I'm not going to steal your mic, I'm just going to stand here. Can you hear me? Put on now? Okay. Yeah. I'll let you guys keep your mics. Um, so, so two things. Number one, I want to, just, just following in, in Jesse's talk yesterday, so I want this to be a panel of goats, not sheep. Okay, so you're not just going to talk to me, you're going to talk to each other, okay? Yeah, you can, you can, it can be as disorderly as you like. <clears throat> um, you know, I'm, I'm just going to do an hour of improv here. Um, actually, I want to, I, I want to um, drop in to the middle of the panel here and Jeff, ask Jessica the first question, and, and then we can start a discussion with this. So you mentioned, you know, you're documenting how teachers are actually using it. 
So my question is, okay, what are they doing? What are they doing? And, 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 and this, for not just me, but for everybody. So is it different than what we think they're doing? It is, it is actually. And teachers are doing it in all kinds of different ways, which is part of the reason why we're doing video case studies instead of just writing about it. Because one of the things that teachers are really great at doing is looking at what one teacher is doing in a classroom and adapting it for their own environment. I'm not sure if it's a personality type of people who come into the profession, but it's really very interesting to me to, to see like that you, if you show how something looks, you can really adapt it for your own environment. So we're going into all kinds of different classrooms, all kinds of different student populations. We're, um, our, first five, uh, our first five videos were set in New York City, but our next five are gonna be all over the country. Um, and we're actually, now we're really looking at, the next five are gonna be about um, training that next generation of teachers who are playing games. So we're talking to teachers about what, what lessons they would pass on to new teachers coming into the profession and also coming into using games in the classroom. Um, just in terms of some examples of what yeah. teachers are doing, I mean, you know, we've heard a lot about Minecraft in the classroom, and so I've gotten to see that on the ground. It looks very different um, in Joel's classroom, Joel Levin's classroom on the Upper West Side of New York, than it probably would, you know, in Oakland or in another part of the country. So we're actually, you know, trying to show it across different places. Um, and teachers are doing, teachers are doing this, um, they're bringing their own um, type of, the, the type of teaching they do, their personal pedagogies, and they're crafting, you know, you changing the games, modding the games a little bit to suit those styles. So you're just gonna see it look, you know, completely different in completely different classrooms. But I would say what the, um, the universal message is of it is that uh, the kids are really taking over. And you know, these are teachers who are letting the, their own authority be um, modulated a little bit while they're teaching, and they're letting the kids lead a lot of the classrooms, and that's what's really exciting. So yeah, I, I, I just wanted to, maybe this is coming from a different perspective, I just wanted to share with you something. One of my, uh, one of our staff at iCivics is, uh, is enrolled in a professional development course right now online with a, with a lot of other teachers. And this is just, these are just two of the things that were recently posted to an online discussion that she was participating in. Uh, the first is, internet goes down and two or more classes are just trying to complete the STAR test in Arizona, that's the standardized test. Too many teachers are trying to stream or download anything from the web and crash district-wide. There are only five schools. I know I will get discouraged and try and stop trying to use the technology. One teacher with 30 kids can only do so much. And the other is our, our district joke is our technology department is an anti-technology department. They're so understaffed that they are against anything that could possibly create more work for their department. Um, you know, I was just uh, in Chicago and, and we went to a school where uh, forget about internet connectivity, each classroom only had two outlets for electricity, and if you plug both of them at the same time, you lose both. So, you know, we're talking about a, a very sad situation where, you know, I remember when I was in school in, in the 80s, we, we had promised uh, that we were going to have one-to-one -one computing. It, it's 20, 30 years later, and we don't have one-to-one -one computing, forget about all the other things that we've been talking about. So. One of the things that we see, especially because we work with social studies teachers, are there any social studies teachers here? All right. Um, you know, I, I think uh, one of the one of the upshots of, of uh, standards and accountability has been pushing aside the untested subject matters out to the out to the edges of, of you know not being served very well with with resources. And so we work with teachers who are often last in line to get technology. Um, and so. What we're seeing is that teachers are doing everything possible to get access to, for example, games. They uh, sometimes we see that kids get to go work one to one with their computers. Other times they bunch up five to one. Uh, very often it's just a projector on the on the screen or smart board where the entire classroom plays a game together. And uh, fortunately, a lot of our games are specifically designed for that you know different kinds of use. But the 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 ability for me to imagine Minecraft in most of the schools that we're dealing with uh, is very hard because what we're encountering is such ridiculous low bandwidth. I'm hoping, I mean, the title of this, of this panel is, is, you know, 2020. I'm hoping that in seven years we will actually have some semblance of one-to-one -one computing <laughs> and broadband uh, for the time being in terms of working with what we're finding, and we're not assuming that at all. I want to, can I follow really quick on the bandwidth issue? Um, because I think the infrastructure uh, issue is actually something that's really uh, critical and that often gets left out of the discussions. And we often take it for granted that, you know, there's 8 million tablets being sold and tablets are going to the classrooms left and right, that, uh, that you know, these schools are set up and wired to be able to access this content. 
Um, and one of the most innovative uh, work that I've seen in the course of my work is from a nonprofit called the Education Superhighway, which is basically just doing some bandwidth tests for every school in the nation to see how much bandwidth they're actually getting. It's like that at that speed test. You just say like hit a button and tells you, uh, you know, what your download speeds are. And you know their initial findings are that 80% of the schools are not equipped, uh, you know, to be able to handle streaming multiple videos at a time. And so you know I'm really happy to see like some of these great content, like great games that are being built and being put in the cloud. But if schools aren't able to access them, then you know that's uh, that's kind of disappointing. Me. And also you know when they and then some some of what I see is when there are um, there is a ton of technology pushed into a school at a level with no. Um, coordinated professional development around it. Um, it's really up to the teacher to figure out like how they're going to use this stuff in the classroom with the limited um, internet access that they might have. And so, you know, that's what we've been really focusing on: examples, implementation examples. As you um, said in your introduction, you know, what are going to be those um, uh, models that teachers are going to use to see how this works in the classroom when they're going to have to do a lot of that work on their own. So I think that touched on two things: sort of technology ecosystem and platform, and also teachers in general. I want to briefly touch on both and build on what, what Gene mentioned about uh, technology platforms. So in the, in the commercial game industry, when I started uh, in the early 90s, you know, we had uh, Nintendo and Sega, and then Microsoft came along, and Apple and Mac. We, to be successful, we had to, we had to build technology and game design that would support an evolving, fragmented ecosystem. We had to have agile technology. We had to have really smart ears on the ground. It is no different in the school system right now. You have computer labs with varying aging Macs and PCs. You have tablets, iOS and Android. You have OEMs coming in like, like Amplify. It's not going to change. The, 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 we get print products all the time. These, these folks have put a ton of effort into a game in the, in the small G, G would be a, you know, a small G game that covers a tiny bit of material that works on one platform. And even if there's great learning, even if there's great research, it is fundamentally not taking a meaningful amount of time in the classroom. It's not replacing time or money. It's just, it's just not tuned to do that. And it's a crime that all that effort and insight and research is not going into something that can really make meaningful impact. So I think up front, you have to understand the ecosystem of the technology and the platforms, and it's changing. So you need an agile system that can move with that, especially if it's a service, not a product. So sometimes you have games that are products that you play and finish and you can sell. But a lot of the more adaptive or personalized systems or the systems that are constantly tuned for learning impact, these are services that need a dedicated team to support them. And that's where the funding comes in, because if that's a grant-based funding mechanism, how do they sustain the team just as they're starting to get traction and learn what they're doing and optimize it? So that's another sort of factor that we need to look at. There's a bunch more, but I'll just pause there. So, so actually, just to follow up, I mean, if I'm, a, if I'm a developer sitting in the audience here, you know, Tell me what, what advice I should uh, be listening to. I mean, I, I, and I'm, I mean, and I'm, and let's say, uh, just to make it kind of more concrete, sorry. Um, and I've got a little G game. I mean, do I band with seven other little G games to make a big G game? What, what should yeah, it, it, it is the question. I mean, it's actually why I went out to Arizona to, to really think, like, I, I think Jim's in the audience. So when he did his keynote last year on Big G, which were a lot of very powerful insights around the importance of affinity space, identity, modding, critical things that happen around a bounded game, like an adventure game, uh, that can only do so much in terms of learning. It could be great for motivation, might set up a lesson, might teach a concept, but certainly can't cover the whole curriculum. A lot of the power stuff is in this big G infrastructure. But then we sort of were tasked with, how do we distill that into a, 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 a technology platform? Because you can't rebuild this for every project that can handle a lot of small G modules. So we're thinking a lot about that. I, I would say the meta advice is think about it. Think about the full life cycle of what you're doing. Before you jump in and start on the design, think about the whole life cycle of you know, who are the stakeholders, what is the impact, what is the context, how are you going to assess it, how are you going to sustain it if it's a service. Think about the full life cycle. And if the answer is to be part of a larger package, who has larger packages? You know, could you be part of iCetics? Could you be part of the platform we're building? Could you be part of Amplify? Think about that all up front, and then contextualize your research insights, your impact insights, into that thought process. I have, I'm, I'm so actually, if I don't, if you don't mind asking the question, the audience again, are, are there developers here who are working on solutions for this space? Cool. All right, awesome. Game makers, others. 
They're kind of slowly raising their hand. Yeah. <laughs> 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 sure I mean, you know, I, I, I think I, I would make a distinction uh, between what you might call learning games, games that are, are designed to go straight to uh, students, learners, young people, whatever your target audience is. I mean, this is the games for change conference, so you know, a lot of folks here might be targeting adults. Um, so reaching those folks directly, and uh, the other approach, the other theory of change, reaching them indirectly through teachers. Uh, and if you want to reach youth in a scalable way um, and in a democratic way, I would really say you probably want to think very hard about the second. Uh, and in that case, you're, you're thinking about two, you have, to have a, you have to have two lenses on at the exact same time. One is what's good for the learner, and the second is what's good for the teacher, whether that's a parent or a, uh, you know, like an actual classroom teacher or an after school program uh, director. Um, you have to meet both needs at the same time. But that probably <coughs> means going to whoever's funding you and, and educating them about that, that it's actually going to be more work than maybe originally if you just want to meet the needs of the learner. Um, so I would say I very strongly suggest you know, being cognizant and learning a lot about what problem you're trying to solve, not for just the student, but also for the person who is your gatekeeper to reaching those young people. So, um you know, you mentioned that uh, your work is somewhat inspired by coming to Games for Change and, you know, seeing this. And this is actually, the, this, I've heard this story a couple times throughout the conference that, um, and it's true of my research too, like my, my research is directly inspired by a day three years ago at Games for Change where I heard an entire day about Games for Learning that mentioned a lot about the developers and a lot about the kids, but nothing about teachers. I think there is maybe one person who even said the word teacher the entire day. Um, and I really felt like this is a missing piece of the puzzle. You know, as you call them, they're the gatekeepers to bringing a lot of this into the classroom. And I really, I want to really encourage teachers to think, like sort of, uh, again, what Katie said about, you know, melding those in and out of the classroom experiences, really innovating your teaching, what kinds of pedagogies you're using to come to deliver content, um, but also to, um, you know, get more involved in, in these new tools that are being developed. And, um, I also hear a lot from game developers, they want to really empathize with their problems in the classroom. But ultimately, I think from a business standpoint, it, it's very tricky because I mean, teachers have pretty limited purchasing powers. And at some point, if you're trying to sell into schools, you have to go through uh, a district level, which can be very complicated. Well, it's not if your app is 99 cents. Well, it, I mean, and there are marketplaces right now. If teachers are, and more and more I see teachers are buying your apps. Yeah, I'm yeah. talking about the market. I mean, there, there are like channels like, uh, I think in, in California, there's like Edmodo, I think, which gave a talk here yesterday, and I think there's uh, this chalkboard here in New York. So I think there are these uh, creations of these uh, uh, marketplaces where you can distribute some of these apps. And I think what's also most uh, promising right now here in New York is that I believe that the New York City uh, Department of Education has an initiative called Innovation Zone, which is really trying to reform their processes, their procurement process, by which these schools and districts and classrooms really work and interact with startups. And they recently uh, completed uh, a gap app challenge where they invited these game developers to contribute some app apps um, to give them some prizes. But I think what's more important is that they say that for the finalists, you know, they're offering to actually pilot them in public school classrooms, which is a really great foot in the door uh, for, for developers. So um, I also like, uh, recommend that you guys just Google like NYC gap app to get a good sense of the, uh, of the range of quality of games that are, you know, being developed for the class. Yeah, GAP? Yeah, NYC. NYC gap app. Yeah, gap app challenge. Okay. You know, I want to talk a little bit about how the market is changing. And actually, I one of the things I wanted to ask Chris directly, can you talk to us about um, the, the sad story of the U.S. textbook market? Yeah. And it's, I say sad with kind of, you know, air quotes. Um, because this is a really interesting story. I want to hear a little bit more about that. Sure. I, I just wanted to add one 15-second comment on teachers. We, we host a conference every year called the Ed Growth Summit. We started about five years ago as the Venture uh, Technology Investment Forum with, with uh, Stanford and now we're in New York City. We have a competition where we host, we review about 150 to 200 companies a year and showcase a dozen of them. And most of those companies get financing through the event, which is something that we do as a, a service to the marketplace. But it's amazing to me when I ask, I ask the same question to every one of the companies that ultimately get showcased. Did you have teacher involvement in your publishing plan, your design plan, in the, you know, if it's a, a manipulative the ergonomics of what you're doing? Has it been commented on by teachers? And unless they were a teacher 
a started company? The answer is 99% of the time is no. Actually, Amplify said that yesterday, that they did not involve teachers as much as they could have in the design process. One of, the, so one of the interesting things I think that could be a solution for that is many of the incubators that are out there, and there's arguably too many of them that are focused on ed tech, are thinking about providing a service to companies that has feedback loop from administrators, but instructors and teachers as a means to help define their, their development plans and how their IP gets created. And I think that's a hugely, uh, huge, huge requirement for success in these markets. Um, pivoting to the SAS story of the textbook market, um, you know, since 2008, two very interesting things happened in K-12 and also in the consumer market, fueled by the, the Great Recession. One was the textbook oligopoly of Pearson, McGraw, Hill, Holcomb, and Harcourt experienced a 48% decline in revenues. So that the number again? 48%. Thank you. Uh, in four to five years. And the, 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 the oligopoly was affected by state tax receipts and federal funding, uh, but also a transition in spending where the, those dollars didn't necessarily vaporize, they've been transferred to other areas, adaptive assessment, other new assessment models, formative assessment models, new forms of content. Um, and secondarily, in the consumer market, I think there's a very interesting phenomenon that's taken place fueled by the, the Great Recession, and that is dollars that are invested in educational resources by parents and grandparents and learners are more and more increasingly being used, used through the lens of um, efficacy, and do they have a learning outcome benefit. Is, is the learning actually taking place? And I think that's a very good underpinning for the next five years in terms of consumer behavior and investment in this space. And as we, as we talk about engaging teachers more in this process, we definitely need to engage parents more as well. I mean, we know that research has shown that um, you know, across socioeconomic groups, uh, kids often have access to the same technology, but it's what they're using on those devices that's very different. So affluent kids have access to a lot more of these um, products with, learning, with great learning outcomes, and it's really just that the parents don't know what else is out there, uh, alternative apps and games that they can give their kids um, that might have some you know, better educational content within it. To, to build on a couple of comments, um, I, I think in terms of getting to, working with teachers and getting to teachers, there's a very different bottoms up distribution methodology versus the top. If, you know, how it relates or doesn't relate to the standards, like being ahead of the curve on that, and then, crucially, teacher-to-teacher -teacher recommendation. And working with the community center, one of the most amazing things that came out of the research that we did on teachers and gaming was that everyone thought it would be the younger teachers, the gamer generation, but it was actually a lot of the older teachers that were the early adopters because they were comfortable in the classroom. You know, the historian guys are good examples of that. And they could be mentors for the younger teacher. So every day we have a team thinking about that life cycle. What we don't know is how we teachers like our product because they chose it. Uh, and that's a wonderful space to be in. We don't know how big that market is. We're growing, we're growing. iCivics has a similar model. Now that we've reached a certain scale, we have an opportunity to do top-down sales, district sales, even state sales. We're talking to, to regions. Um, now we're in a position where teachers are going to be asked to do something they didn't necessarily want to do in a format they were not necessarily comfortable with. And it's going to be a different set of support, professional development support mechanisms to know how to do that well. So that's an interesting, but they're different methodologies, kind of bottoms up versus top down. That's a great. That's a great point that we're in this traditional transitional moment and not really sure how to support teachers to do that work. Um, I wanted to just give a shout out to some of the new web sites that are coming out around engaging teachers around this. One of which is called Playful Learning, um, and it's a great. Um, you know, we we've been Cooney Center has been working pretty closely with Playful Learning, trying to. Um, activate that teacher network, that teacher to teacher network of getting teachers to talk about how they're using games in the classroom and then showing that through um, lesson plans and implementation ideas and passing on recommendations to others. And, and we really think that's going to be the way that this it drives a lot of the teacher uh, use of games over time. You know, um, one of the things I want to follow up on something Chris said, you know, this efficacy question. Um, you know, do, are we going to get into a situation where, you know, where motion math is replacing? Angry birds on people's iPads. I mean, it, 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 is that what we're talking about? Or yeah, in, ter I mean, in terms of areas that we look to invest and what we see happening, um, we just put out a white paper, a couple of white papers for the Gates Foundation last month on adaptive assessment. And just in the higher ed market, we profiled 73 companies, most of whom have not been around for more than a couple of years at most. And it just it's an illustration of where the market's heading, where capital and resources to develop IP are going, and ultimately. If games can show validation of learning pathways and show improvements of learning outcomes, um, 
melded with adaptive assessment what that all means over time. I think those will define some of their success stories in, in games-based learning. Mm -hmm. And that's a long ways away, but it's something that we look for and advocate uh, developers and folks that we may put capital behind to think about because it's, it's, it's well, a well, crucial it's ability to help, help learners. You know, at the same time, though, I was thinking about something Katie said in the previous panel. You know, she said she gets the, all these emails from developers and she passes them on to her teachers and 90% of them go nowhere. That is, only, I'm, I'm, this is my own interpretation of what she said, but only, 10, only one in 10 has any kind of stickiness. Um, does that seem right? Uh, and should people be surprised? Any, this is for anybody, really. I'm not surprised the number's that high, actually. You're surprised it's that high? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it's, uh, I mean, we, we get pitched flippers of, of products, and it's just astounding, which is exciting. And, 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 and they're getting better and better. But, but I mean, it's similar to what I said before, that they're, it's hard to get our heads around how it would apply in the classroom. And I think teachers, you know, they're, they're incredibly busy. If, if it's gonna help them teach, they're gonna see it pretty quickly, or they need to see it pretty quickly, and maybe there's a diamond in the rough being missed. And, so. maybe, and maybe they don't need some of the little G games that come out that are um, just a you know, one-to-one -one replacement of something they already do probably successfully in the classroom. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that Katie's in Minecraft is the one that you know, over time has really endured. It's a completely open sandbox mm -hmm. uh, where any teacher can um, you know, gather I mean, I think it's got to be frictionless, and it has to save time. Um, I mean, even when you, even when we talk about providing support and training for teachers to use these tools, I think that begs the question: like, why does your tool require such level of support and training before I even use it? Um, you know, I don't have time to really sift through, you know, two two days of, of training in order to use your tool effectively. Well, we one post just on the consumer question because that came up also. I think in Katie's comments, this idea that we got to break down the barriers between in school and out of school learning, which fundamentally, you know, I definitely believe in, but it's actually really, really hard to do. And I'll, I'll use again GameStar as an example, because that, we, we break what we do into gateways, pathways, and foundations. Gateways are consumer-facing products that can really fire the imagination, introduce concepts, but don't try to get deep. It's a gateway to learning, like the work we're doing with the Alaska Natives that we talked about yesterday on the consumer side. Um, foundations are, uh, trying to take real core learning that kids might not want to do, but really need to learn foundational skills. And then Pathways is interest-driven learning where they already come with an identity and a disposition. I want to be a maker, I want to be a game maker, and then build learning around it. Those are different ways to enter a product. They are different channels and are tuned differently from a design perspective. Game Star Mechanic was interesting because uh, kids are interested in making games. And when we put that in the school, actually Institute of Play was very helpful at getting us to get the kids to slow down, reflect on what they're doing, get the just-in-time skills to be able to think systemically about making a game. There was a much slower rhythm that has made that successful in schools. It actually uh, worked in the exact opposite on the consumer side, where kids want to get in, and they want to start tinkering and playing right away. And the workflow did not work for both, so we're having to we prioritize schools, but we're completely refactoring our consumer version. So it's, and then we get to, do you, if you do it in schools, do you carry your same identity into consumer? Does, does, your, does your level cross over? Do your credentials cross over? Very interesting questions are emerging to get to that simple insight of we got to break down the barriers. So just, just to speak from our own experience at iCivics, uh, when we launched, we had a, a completely different vision of what we might do. We were going to do this huge MMO, and it was going to teach everyone about the importance of the court system, and we're going to have you know people wander around with their law shields. And law shields. Right. And, 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 and Alan, Alan came along and set us straight uh, several years back and said that this is going to go absolutely nowhere. You're not even going to have the funding to finish the damn thing. Forget about marketing it. Um, so we scaled back considerably. Uh, one of the things that we have found. And, and switched over to, to reaching out to teachers and students rather than directly to youth. Um, one of the interesting things that we found is that by reaching students through schools, we have seen uh, some of our research is suggesting up to 50% uh, follow through of kids playing the games at home. When if we were just nakedly competing against Call of Duty, we'd, we'd be seeing you know nothing, right? So. Um, being introduced to the games in school gives us a fighting chance to actually cross over into home use. Now, 
that said, one note of caution that I, I, I would like to sound in this area is that one thing that I want to try to avoid is, um, with all due respect, the Cooney Center is, is what used to be called the Sesame Street effect, right? In other words, if you have an intervention that's out there that maybe lifts all boats, but then the, the, the privileged kids are the ones who actually benefit even more, and what you're doing is widening the gap, because who is going to go home and play those games at home? Obviously kids who have you know computers and internet connections, but also kids whose parents are saying, hey, why are you playing Call of Duty when you could be playing iCivics? Yeah, what, 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 one point on that that was really powerful. Um, so again, to go back to GameStar, it's a creation tool. And teachers told us that, I mean, again, to so the conversation about modding and creation is really important. So there's a lot of great creation tools, Adobe and whatnot. These are very expensive tools. Teachers al almost like with tears in their eyes would say, this is criminal. Like we get kids uh, confident on these tools, they go home and they can't afford them. There's no pathway there. Uh, so to, to, to Gene's point, which I totally agree, if kids get their imagination fired in school, they're gonna wanna keep doing it at home, especially if they have supportive parents. And that can be a whole thing we talk about. But if they can't afford it, that's criminal. So we'll, we actually changed our business model. It's one of the things I'm most proud of. Uh, to uh, the two, We have a free version. Uh, because you know you want every teacher to get to start using it and, and feel comfortable with it. Um, when you go to the premium level, it's two dollars per student for a lifetime membership. The kid has it for the rest of their life, and it's actually been good for our business. And it's the right thing to do. It's an impact-friendly business model. So it just follows the kid. It follows the kid because if if they're learning the tool and they're learning the principles and they want to follow the pathway, it's criminal not to let them do that. Now again, we have to really make sure that's the right business model. It's right for the business. But it seems to be working. We introduced it a few months ago mm -hmm. to, to exactly that goal. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things that Justin said, which, which um, was one of those moments where I really felt, wow, there's an opportunity here. He talked about the survey they did, um, uh, asking teachers if they missed significant life events because they were grading papers, <laughs> um, and, and whether their feedback made any difference at all. And um, I, I wonder if you just gave any thoughts on um, where to go from from here with that? Because that's sort of fascinating. Well, I, I don't know if I would speak directly to that, but I will say that based on my observations of teachers who are using the games in the classroom, one thing that is really addressed with using games is classroom management issues. It is or so isn't? It is. It yeah. is absolutely um, one of the ways that teachers, a teacher, one of the benefits that teachers find to using games in the classroom. Um, a couple things from our survey, um, you know, 70% of the teachers we surveyed said that this helped like level their classroom. Um, that their special needs students were, had access to the same content as their um, top level students. They also said, I think it was 63% said that this helped personalize learning for all the kids in the classroom. And um, in our video case days, we, you know, our, these teachers speak very uh, specifically about how engaging kids in games takes away um, some of the behavioral issues that come up in class. So, I, you know, I haven't surveyed and I haven't really spoken to teachers directly on um, whether this helps. And I, and, I, and I have to say, like, I think in, the, in Justin's what he was talking about was some of the classroom management tools that come with the Amplify tablet-based um, curriculum. Uh, so the games are absolutely a way to address some of those behavioral issues. What about this, this question that Jim brought up, which was that nothing's gonna change unless we have a society, and I think I'm getting this right, that demands makers. Mm -hmm. want to tell I, I, I think that's a, that's a noble uh, objective to hope for, but the way that gets implemented is by understanding the realities of who controls the market. Just talking about K-12 for a minute, one of my biggest points of advice to early stage companies is recognize 85% of the channel in the K-12 schools is controlled by textbook oligopolies and technology oligopolies. That's not going to change in my view for a long time. And the way that you can leverage and uh, beat your competitive segment is to understand and focus the right amount of time on leveraging those relationships and licensing partnerships getting under the hood of the major players in schools, and ultimately through that Trojan course, course approach, if you show efficacy in the classroom because you've been enabled by that channel, then you're going to have uh, the right attributes for success and real scale. And, and one of the roles of the teacher in a game-based game learning environment is to you know, help the students think about self-directed learning. Like how are you, how, you know, what are the pathways you're going to take through this game that might be different from your neighbors or people who you're collaborating with in the classroom? And really uh, sort of reading that, those 21st century skills right there in the classroom of self-directed learning and passion-driven learning, uh, where you can then pursue outside of the classroom or even, you know, within the context of the classroom, what some of the things that you're really interested in. And I think that's what, that's what, tra that's what um, helps the transition between consumers and producers. 
I think um, one of the bigger issues that this gets at is, you know, how how are we changing how we measure uh, student success and outcomes? I mean, are we still going after um, you know grades or like PISA test scores, which a lot of startups like to use as their opening slides for their product? No. Yeah. Uh, these, these PISA test scores. Right. I mean, we always point to we always point to like you know China and you know Singapore as some of the top performers. But if you if you've actually gone to school there, like I have, and then you realize that the way that they achieve those test scores is not through you know fun games, it's through you know very <laughs> mundane and you know very like rote memorization uh, kind of practices that have evolved over like centuries. And so I mean, it gets to a larger question: like, how do we how, how can we change how we measure some of these outcomes then? And all the tools that we use in the classroom, since you know there's money involved and, and since there's time involved, uh, you know there's a demand for accountability as you know, the, the last panel raised, and I guess that's fun, that, that, that's a fundamental challenge to how we really incorporate and use these tools as we imagine how to redesign the classroom or the larger educational experience. Okay. Yeah. Can you know, think quickly here. Very, very quickly. Quick. So I, I think one one key principle of, of entrepreneurship, right? Just be careful what you're disrupting. In our case, you know, don't disrupt the user. What we often do is we look at what are the practices that teachers have and how do we make that process easier. So if I can put a plug in for the next panel after this one, we'll be showing how we've been using iPads to you know, take simulations which are very, very hard for teachers to run and make them more accessible. So you know, start with what's the problem for them and then instead of disrupting them, figure out how to make it easier. You know, I, you know the, the title of the panel is Games 2020. I was going to ask the panel if they would predict what's going to happen to Gene in, at Games for Change in 2020, since <laughs> so much has happened to him so far. But I want to go to the audience for questions. Um, so we, we have a uh, little time for questions. I have only a couple of requirements. Please speak as loudly as you can um, and make it a question. <laughs> okay. So I know that's going to be difficult for some of you, but. Um, and if you, if, yeah, and, and, and if you can, if, if you're okay with it, please stand so we can all hear. We'll try to repeat the question. Oh, this young lady here with the glasses. Uh, yes, I was wondering um, if any of you have explored working with uh, after-school programs, either face-to-face -face or online, and what you would say to them about that and Okay, so the question is, what, what have you, has anybody worked with after-school programs? Well, I'll just say that I, I have actually like observed a lot of after school programs and I use them as examples of how teachers should restructure their classrooms. So, so iCivics has a, a national partnership with the Boys and Girls Club of America and so we, we have been working with them. I think what we've found in the partnership is that, you know, as we've been kind of saying over and over again here, when you're optimizing for one particular audience, it's almost by definition not for another. And so the more that we've kind of <coughs> tuned our, our, our work for schools and classrooms, you know, kind of the, the less good of a fit that might be for after school settings. So, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a trade-off. And, you know, especially with the Boys and Girls Club, what we found is as a marketing, you know, tool, uh, you know, unlike the top-down marketing that you, know, that you can get in districts and states, it, it's like pushing on a string. They can't actually require any, you know, club to do anything. So, it's, 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 you know, you can pull, but you can't push. I mean, this is sort of a variation in a way, of, you know, what Justin said about Amplify, you know, the, they're spending millions of dollars to develop all these incredible games, and they're saying, please don't play them in the classroom. <laughs> please don't. Um, you want to say something? Please? Just one of the tragedies, investment tragedies in the marketplace has been, the, in my view, the supplemental educational services market, where you saw some great companies with great services, where I think one of the best opportunities for impact exists is in after school programs, where some, uh, some rotten apples started to trade parents' bikes or money for bringing a kid to you know, show up in the program. And there was a lot of uh, dollars lost in a lot of companies that became bankrupt or insolvent in that space. And I'm hopeful that that becomes more um, more of an opportunity for developers and games-based learning companies over time because it's a great a great channel to serve kids. I actually think there's a, it's a great it's very fragmented right now, and a lot of the programs are a little bit old in the tooth. I think it's a great opportunity for innovation. We're, we're, we've been studying this space, and we're going to start rolling out our first after-school programs. As an extension on the youth game design, we're going to let kids build their own game studio that's a tie to the school. And but, but we're really looking at how that ecosystem works, who moderates it, how does it structurally work. I actually think it's a great opportunity for innovation. I also think it's a great place, it's a great place for teachers to do.
professional development are in these after school spaces for, the, for them to learn from the kids, you know, how they're using, you know, not just games, but all kinds of different technologies. Hi. I was curious about uh, professional development for teachers and just specifically taking any kind of game, really, and helping them adopt how can I use games, how can I use this game structure, this game's architecture to fit maybe cross content between subjects, but any kind of subject, really. So, uh, sure. so, so, so the question is how can, uh, you know, in the professional development workshops that teachers often attend, how can you really uh, scaffold how to, you know, use game, how to adapt games for all kinds of different content? How successful has it been? And, you know, I, no, it's really difficult, and I think that one of the, one of the, um, if you even want to like take a step backwards, the, the entire world of professional development is a little bit broken. You know, how professional development is delivered, how is it, how it's funded, how, you know, what the participation level is, the authentic participation level is from teachers. Um, and so one thing that I would advocate is to bring games into PD, you know, as a mechanism to do professional development. And I think, you know, it's just basic, um, you know, common sense. If teachers are playing games for their own learning, they're going to be able to see how to adapt that for kids' learning. Yeah, this is, this is, so this is a big, a, a big, probably the biggest project we're working on right now in Arizona is game-based teacher professional development for music technology. I want to come and film it. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's been really fascinating. The, the, the Center for Games and Impact is actually in the largest physical uh, teacher's college in the country. We have 3,000 free service teachers come through the program. And it, it's just amazing to see teacher training up front, as well as the in-service training that happens once they're out there. And you know we're, we're actually developing a full certificate program that is entirely game-based, so teachers can fail safely, model systems, be part of a big G affinity space, identity management, all game-based. And we're using games, like I said, some of our games, some other games, to have them be able to use it in the game to learn how to do it in the classroom. But that gets to how do you run a classroom, how do you become a coach, all of these things naturally flow out. Intel has been a great partner on that, by the way. If you look at their, they've trained 10 million teachers with their, their, they have a 21st century uh, learning curriculum. And literally 10 million teachers have gone through it and they're interested in gamifying it. So there's some really interesting stuff starting to bubble up in that space. It's what true, is this it? is one realm that I think that gamification is not a dirty word. I think it's really a great thing to like, gamify professional development. And I want to add one extra, just one final note to that point. Um, one of the things that I've seen in some of these schools that have been starting starting to use these tech tools and games is that there's been a new role kind of built called a tech integrationist, which kind of sits in between the teachers and the administrators. And I think, you know, their role is to basically uh, be in charge of kind of scoping out technology tools and like providing all the training. And very often these people uh, used to be librarians, right? I mean, schools used to have librarians, but now there's really uh, the, the, the need for them has changed and the role that's involved with this, 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 digital, this uh, digital media specialist that kind of sits in between like teachers and administrators to help them prepare to, to use these tools. Okay, a question later. Yeah, go ahead. Here's the one. Um, nice and loud. How do you maintain the voluntary nature of the engagement from the Because indeed they're supposed to be was how do you maintain the voluntary nature of games in school? You know, it comes back to my, for me, my original statement about the importance of assessment in these models and the successful companies in the game-based learning environment will have an ability to self-measure and self-evaluate their own uh, you know, marketed uh, benefit and be able to show advancement and mastery, not just in terms of a concept of contextual mastery, and no matter what age or learner category you're serving. So I think it all comes down to assessment, in my view. But I think that the developers here do need to be careful about um, not making uh, games, uh, with Dan White was saying yesterday, or Monday, about not making uh, games that are just assessment, because then it's just going to be a test in this you know, interactive environment in some sort. Um, and Katie said a little bit of the same thing too this morning, um, that you know we have to be, it has to be, um, the game has to be playful and rigorous. And the play part is this choice, this free choice within the game environment. Uh, and, and I do think that that can happen in the classroom. Um, but we're still at just the, such the very beginning of this. I, I'm not sure we have any. It doesn't feel it doesn't feel forced down at all in the in the classroom right now. This is, is all voluntary at this point. 
I think what I would like to see in 2020 is schools start offering students the choice to pick between different games that kind of target the same, uh, you know, the same content, right? Because right now, uh, even the most innovative of schools, they tend to rely on one or just two uh, content providers to teach a certain subject. Whereas in reality, we know that uh, you know, even for a subject like math, there's many different pathways, to, many different approaches to uh, you know help students develop mastery, and so uh, you know, similar to the similar to, you know, how, like, you know, I don't really like reading Virginia Woolf, but I like reading, you know, some other authors. I mean, it kind of gets, it, it builds the same level of skills. Like, I would hope to see that there's a more, uh, there's more choice offered to uh, students. But I, I, w I would say just because something is assigned doesn't mean that it, it can't be fun or enjoyable. Uh, we get pretty old. But it's not a game, though. Right. It's assigned, right? No, 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 it's absolutely a game, right? I mean, we, we, I don't think that's, so. not, that's not one of the definitions you can bring Katie back on. I don't see it as one of the definitional, you know, traits of a game. Uh, being no, that it's, it's, it's entirely voluntary, I think. Um, the, 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 the point is, we get pretty strong feedback from teachers that, like, kids, are, kids when they experience, you know, I say this game in the classroom, they keep demanding more of it. And you have to kind of be a little bit realistic about the environment you're talking about. I mean, when you're at home, you know, I say this games are competing against Call of Duty. When you're at school, I say this games are competing against textbooks. It, it's just a, it's an unfair fight then. Yeah, and so. I think Katie has a great definition of, of games, which are, it's an invitation with a contract. And I mean, it's, a, it's a very powerful, I think, uh, definition. W when you choose to do a game in the consumer space, it really is an invitation with the contract. You are opting into this entertainment experience, and there's going to be rules, and, and you're going to go into it. When you, when you are assigned a game-infused experience in school, it's almost a contract with an invitation. And I think from a game designer's perspective, they need to know the psychology of the context that their game is going to be experienced. And the first five, 10 minutes are critical, whether it's in a classroom, or, or whether it, it's at home. So I do think it's a really important question. I do think it has design implications. If you have to engage somebody on a tablet in a few minutes when somebody's surfing, there's a certain design rhythm that you're gonna have to grab them and engage them. If you're going and buying Call of Duty or a box product, you have a lot of time. They've opted in to that invitation and they have a high tolerance for getting to the, you know, they're gonna take a lot of challenges. If you're in a classroom and you have to do it, I believe it still can be game or game infused. You're just coming into it with a different psychology. And that's important for teachers to know how to structure that gameplay over time so that you have the maximum amount of invitation. I guess the question I would have would be, I mean, sort of apropos what you just said, Alan, I mean, you know, if, if, if the kid, if the game doesn't engage the kid in the first two, three minutes, yet the teacher says, no, you need to finish the game. Doesn't it become just more of the same? I mean, it's probably a poorly designed well, experience. Let's say it's a poorly designed experience, and it's the, but it's the only one they've got. Yeah. Because the, because the school bought that game. I mean, it's, it's, and that's why I would say that it's really important for teachers to be part of that process. Because exact, so exactly like how Katie said that you know 90% of the games that came through were X'd out by the teachers, that's going to be one of them. Okay. A question we no we had a balcony. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Speak up really loud. Uh, hi, um, volunteer. Just a quick question. How do you deal with like I guess the mixed message that our society is sending children that we have to be like information like college is very information textual based. Like read the textbook, regurgitate what the textbook says or what the professor says, and you're gonna get an A in a class. But our society, at least the digital age, is moving towards, you know, Twitter, 140 characters or less. Tumblr, blog, it's all, you know, blog and stuff like that. How are video games going to be a game changer in that way? On what side of the fence are going to be going to fall off? Like, the brevity of video games is simple. There's not that much text, more interaction. It's like controls and stuff like that. How can video games change that mixed signal that we're sending kids in society? Like, read a lot, but when you're at responding, be short, be curt. How do you so do can, that? So is your question sort of, can games change our expectations of it? Sort of. Like, can we bridge that gap between information base where it's long textbooks where it's kind of boring to be honest yeah. and you know brevity where it's quick and fast and you get the gist of it. So um, so the question I guess is can games sort of change our expectations of, of how kids become literate? Sort of, yeah. Okay, and guess what? We only have 38 yeah, seconds to answer that. But um, let's take let's take just a minute or two and try to get better because that's gonna be be our last question. I actually think it's, it, 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 the question touches on, a, on an even deeper set of issues. And I, I have a 12 and a 14 year old, so I really watch, I watch the unbelievable social media consumption 
And there was a good article, I think it was the cover of Time, or, that, that touched on this as well, which is, I mean, it's, it's not only the brevity, which is interesting from a literacy level, from a writing level, but even the idea that everything is about leadership and how many followers you have, and that kids are spending a lot more time with their peers at a younger age than with adults. I mean, these are, these are issues we're just beginning to understand as a parent, as a sector. Um, I, I, I do think we need to understand these issues much, much better, because I think they're gonna have enormous implications, not all that, a, a very complex matrix. And I do think games, as we start to see if things are emerging, like um, we need to foster more empathy or we need to be aware of what this sort of leadership follower culture looks like, how can games start to provide a counterweight in terms of what they value and how you level up? So I, I, I think there's a, you're touching on a lot of issues that I do think we need to play in, but we need to understand better, we need to experiment a little more. It's a great question. Let's, let's, we're out of time, so let's, let's, this will be our last thought. And I want to get um, the rest of you folks in there too. So go ahead. So actually, I, would, I pushed the other direction, call back to something that Jim had raised in, in his point, which is you know, how, what, are the, what are the challenges that we face as humanity that can be so bold, and, and what can games do about that? And I, a really advanced idea that games uniquely as a medium convey concepts of systems that no other medium can, whether you're talking about film or books. And the challenges that we face in this century and beyond are challenges of systems. And I think rather than thinking about how we make you know, thinking shorter and, and faster, I, I think how do we make it deeper, and more complex, more inter interconnected. And I really think games are uniquely situated you know, at this moment when we really need that most of all as a way of thinking. So I think we need some games that actually get to this point that you were talking about, exploring these ideas of what happens when you, um, you know, this, this, all your social currency is around having followers or you know, presenting your persona you know, updated on a minute-to-minute -minute basis through social media. Chris, you want to have one last thought? Uh, just that I think that you know, there's, there needs to be a balance in, in concede, concede the practicality that uh, the successful things that will emerge in games-based learning, I think will show uh, in a tie back to either learning advancement or some type of skill, imagine a credential, something that will give the learner benefit, but also society as it's looking for those learners to provide uh, a framework to build in the next generation of great things and ideas. Um, and so I, I, I look to that balance. Tonight. Tony, you have a last word? Yeah, so I guess my final thought is that I think when you, when you think about, you know, what what are we trying to raise kids, and what is the goal of teaching, you know, of educating kids? Um, I mean, it ties, it, it really ties to the point of, I mean, society doesn't really reward you for, uh, I mean, what you know per se, but how you can adapt to the to your changing environment and how fast you can pick up new skills. And I think it's this problem solving because it's conditions uh, in which we live and work in are always changing, like day by day. And the jobs that you know we want our kids to, to, to have are not necessarily tied to specific skills in the past, but how fast they can adapt and um, you know try to transform and pick up new ideas and work off, work upon them in the future. I wish we had more time but we're out of time. Thanks so much everyone.